Stars The Incredibles presents a wealth of themes from the over-obsession of heroism to having an even-keeled perspective on being exceptional. However, there's one thread that weaves the others together, and that's the family dynamics as demonstrated by the Pars. The film's director, Brad Bird, describes the Pars through the powers they possess, starting with the husband and father, Bob. Being the family's patriarch, he holds the physical strength necessary to bear through any conflict. Next, there's Helen, the rubber band that's perpetually stretched in every direction to fulfill her duties as a housewife. Finally, there are the kids, Violet, Dash, and Jack-Jack. Violet, being socially distant from her school peers, literally hides herself from the world with her invisibility. Dash is a ball of energy that leaves dust trails behind, moving from place to place no average person can fathom. Then there's Jack-Jack, the newest member in the family's little mystery box. And together, they are the Pars, staying under the radar for 15 years after the government put the super relocation program in motion. Whether one thinks the structure reeks of patriarchal expectations or it's the best family formation bar none, the Pars are the quintessential nuclear family. Although the definition has expanded, it's a single family unit that consists of a married heterosexual couple and their biological children. Much like the sitcoms of the past, the Pars perform the daily functions of the average nuclear family. The kids attend school, the wife takes care of the household, and the husband clocks into his 9 to 5 to bring home the bacon. However, with this superhero family, there is dysfunction in the mix. To begin, let's center our focus on Helen and Bob's progeny, starting with the extremely energetic 10-year-old wishing to unleash his full potential, Dash. A child's impulsivity is quelled through physically engaging activity. In a study conducted by Garamani et al., it concludes that despite the degree of impulsiveness, introducing physical activities can positively influence a student's cognitive functions, from impulse control to choice selection. In other words, give a kid some time to play and they'll be better for it, essentially allow the world to be their oyster. However, because the society the child belongs to is a bit too skittish in accepting or tolerating what they can do in terms of their powers, they must suppress that aspect of themselves. With keeping that trade underground, the other undesirable features of a person will break through the cracks. For Dash, it's his penchant for troublemaking. Aside from being a disruptive influence in his class, he likes playing pranks on his teacher, almost getting caught on camera placing attack on their seat. He knows it would be an issue for the family if their cover's blown since this is his third time in this predicament. Unfortunately, if there are no alternative outlets for the kid, then they'll make their own fun regardless of the potential risks. Dash tries explaining this to his mom when they have this conversation. None of these problems would manifest if he were allowed to go out for sports. However, Helen can't have any of that lest they want to show up on the radar. With this ball and chain placed around Dash's ankles, it's no wonder he feels his powers weigh him down if he can't let loose and excel at the things he knows he can do. But Bob has the opposite opinion. He's more impressed that Dash can move so quickly that he eluded the camera's gaze. The fact that Dash can even express his abilities despite the trouble he caused, Bob sees it as an admirable thing. Dash may get the praise that comes with using his powers, but it puts him at a crossroads. Dad would love nothing more than for his son to showcase his talents, whereas mom would rather keep things under wraps to avoid the family from being examined under a microscope. How does a kid marry two ideological positions constantly at odds with one another without the wait-and-see approach? The short answer is, they don't. Then again, what's really stopping a curious and energetic 10-year-old that can roll around at the speed of sound from snooping around? Nothing. And he'll swipe both his and Violet's matching costumes, ask the question why would mom try to hide them, and find a way to sneak onto her private jet traveling to a remote island. And once they reach their destination, Helen relays their current situation. We're on a remote island, dad's in trouble, the people on this island are not like the villains you're used to watching on TV, let alone the average people back home. If there's any hint of danger, use your powers. The world Dash is in can now be his oyster. His powers are immediately put to the test when he and Violet separate after the island guards get the jump on them. Once they split, the island becomes, pun intended, his jungle gym. A red blur able to duck and dodge the enemy's attempts to cut him down. Dash even discovers he can run on water. Water. What he perceived at first as a haphazard family vacation turned into a litmus test to prove his excellence, and from doing such a great job away from and back home against the Omnidroid, his mom throws away his shackles and lets him join the track team. If he wanted to, he'd go for the gold, but second place silver is nothing to scoff at either. Next comes Violet, the quiet, timid, and emotionally distressed eldest child. It's difficult enough for a teenager to formulate an individual identity while being inundated with the general malaise of figuring out where one fits in within the ecosystem that is school. British professor of psychology Dr. Blakemore in chapter 3 of her book, Inventing Ourselves, expresses how it's necessary for an adolescent to find the tribe, and to accomplish this goal, observe the cultural norms their classmates follow so that those bonds can be created. Meaning if a teenager can take enough social 
boxes from what they wear and how they act. So participating in the same activities among other things, making friends does not become a hassle. However, if one's attire deviates from the general look of the population, they make no effort at navigating through the social realm outside of longingly gaze at their crush, and on top of that, keep hitting their abilities that divides them further, an anxious person who actively stays out of sight from others is birthed. Keep in mind, the parents are their frame of reference as how to socially interact with the world. Unfortunately, Violet doesn't get much out of it considering both her parents are exposed to the same pressures as far as concealing their powers go, and on the emotional support side of things, Bob is too mentally drained from living his average life as a salary man, and Helen is too busy tending to Jack Jack and dealing with Dash's troublemaking. Plus, while watching both her parents regularly argue, Violet kind of realizes she's left her own devices to solve the problem. But there's nothing to solve, because it's easier to disappear than it is to be seen. The thing is though, she does want to be seen, going as far as criticizing her mother for the way she demands everyone to refrain from using their powers for the sake of the family's safety. Sure, not getting pinged by the government is what's best, however, if the eldest child has no reference point on how to navigate the greater society with this restriction, anything about normalcy that escapes the tongue will be called out as tone deaf. Acting normal is an anxiety inducing chore, Violet wants to remove the mask and be normal. Unfortunately, the way the stage is currently set, she must continue to wear it and play her part. Not only is she plagued with social isolation, there's also the lack of confidence and curiosity. Both feelings stem from her parents' constant arguing. Although Bob and Helen say they're always a team, always united, in Violet's eyes, this sentiment contradicts what they present. The entire dinner scene supports this idea, not to mention their last argument. When both parents are constantly at odds with each other, it doesn't breed confidence in the kids. It only causes eyebrows to be raised. Violet knows why they're arguing on the surface, but doesn't know what else is baked in. When she's put in charge of the house so Helen can search for her husband, she's given vague clues on the matter, but something still seems off. Why is dad in trouble and why is mom leaving the house for either a rescue mission or a manhunt? Strike one. So, she begins probing, questioning her mother about the three costumes she's packing, but is immediately shooed away. Strike two. The mystery begins once Violet uses her powers on her costume and it instantly disappears. Strike three. Now it's time to see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Keeping secrets isn't conducive for any healthy dynamic. Keeping secrets from a teenager that sees some of the writing on the wall and they'll pull out the go-go gadget magnifying glass ready to solve the case. So she and Dash decide to stow away in Helen's borrowed jet. Why? For Violet, it's to piece together what's up with her parents. Even though she hears Helen declare her definite return, there's still a degree of uncertainty considering how she's partially privy to her parents' interpersonal conflict. That's enough reason to get on the case. But how does a social recluse without confidence in the world they know interface with the unknown parts of the map? Quick answer, not too well. When the plane is under missile fire, Violet's assigned to cover the plane with her force field. However, she has never conjured anything of this magnitude since the family can't use their powers in public. Her lack of confidence to use her powers is what causes the plane to go down. Because Violet could not rise to the occasion, she beats herself up over being too weak to effectively do what was asked of her. However, all it takes to build any confidence is a positive push. Helen plants the seed of self-assuredness by filling her in on her potential. Violet has more power than she realizes and when the opportunity presents itself, she'll have it figured out. Like Helen says, it's in her blood. With that little push, it allowed Violet to shift her perspective. She wears her hair back, revealing her face to the world instead of hiding behind it. She practices conjuring force fields in the cave to gain better control, even going as far as covering her brother with a protective force field to block the bullets coming his way. The seed of self-assuredness finally bloomed into confidence. Violet is now capable of contributing to the family's fighting effort to escape the island and subdue the Omnidroid, wreaking havoc in the city. Thanks to the situation and her mother's pep talk, this confidence is translated back into her social life at school. Needless to say, she won't be hiding from the world anymore. When the husband's clocked in at work, the wife's taking care of the household. The nuclear family was fully realized after the Second World War because the U.S. became the world's steward for economic recovery, considering most nations were left crippled. Since the U.S. massively expanded their production capacity, plus liberalized international trade, and presented an economic policy called the Marshall Plan to help Western European nations recover, the country positioned itself to be the premier global economy. In short, the U.S. gave money to friends so they can rebuild their stuff, they opened their stores for those new friends to buy their stuff, 
and had many jobs back home when the war ended, the returning men can work to make that stuff. Because of this economic uptick stateside, the American dream was finally possible, especially after living through the Great Depression. A family could live off one person's income, meaning for a huge majority of Americans, both parents didn't need to work. One can go out and make money for the household while the other takes care of it. Keep in mind, America was mostly a capitalist country at this time, New Deal legislation notwithstanding. For example, when there are changes to the flow of business and an employee is moved to a new worksite to meet the needs of that facility, mobilizing a small family is easier compared to the logistical nightmare of moving a multi-generational extended family living under one roof. However, this setup doesn't work for everyone. What was gained with having many perspectives and supporting bodies that an individual's reach from an extended family together is now deferred to a single immediate family. Since the husband is making money for the household, everything else regarding it from the upkeep to the rearing of their children falls on the wife. But here's the problem. Women worked the more masculine jobs while the men stormed the beaches of Normandy. When the war ended and the men came home, guess who had to relinquish their jobs and return to their lives as domestic servants? A lot of women couldn't readjust after having a taste of independence. So to ease the anxiousness of mundane domestic life, those wives indulged in barbiturates. A free bird values a sense of individuality and self-determination. Put that same bird in a cage and problems will sprout. However, for Helen Parr, she's able to make that adjustment seeing how her ability to stretch in any and every direction makes her household duties easier. Before she became Helen Parr, she was Elastigirl, the superheroine with the star power that rivals her husband to be and friend to the family Frozone. If anyone were to ask her 15 years prior if she would ever settle down, she'd scoff at the question. She's at the peak of her career. Any reasonable person at the time would be shocked at her response because most believe the highest aspiration for a woman is taking care of her husband, but she's also a superhero. Participating in a male-dominated occupation means to some degree a woman would have to adopt some of those masculine traits just to keep up with her male counterparts at the highest level. The self-assuredness of the choices they make when fighting crime, the bravado to posture and demoralize the villain of the day, and the effortlessness when displaying their skills on the field. Elastigirl has all of that in a bag of chips given her flexibility, but it does not necessarily mean Helen's mentality is when it comes to her values. She is most definitely beholden to the social expectations of the time with her real identity, hoping her husband shares the same feelings. She tells him right to his face, I love you, but if we're gonna make this work, you gotta be more than Mr. Incredible. Or to boil it down further, Bob's identity as a superhero must play no substantial role over his family for this arrangement to function. They must be equally yoked in this. Helen can pull her weight, but the plow will not move unless Bob keeps up with his end in tandem. And with supers legislatively written out of public life, this endeavor should be exponentially easier. However, it only becomes more difficult. Not for Helen per se. Ironically, she made it through the adjustment smoothly. Renouncing the public use of her powers is just another social expectation she can work within. It's not where her inflexibility stems from. Helen and her role as mother and housewife runs on the logic of what's best for the family, with appearing normal being her highest priority. The more normal and mundane the pars look individually and as a collective, the less eyes will look their way, because no one ever knows who's really watching them. The hard part comes in when members of the family can't fit this mold. Bob is so physically strong that if he doesn't interact with the world using the slightest touch, most of it would bend like cardboard. Since Dash can't participate in sports, he'll find other ways to express himself no matter how much trouble he'll cause. Violet, who can generally hold back the use of her power, still breaks the rule whenever she can because of her social ineptitude. Although Helen tries her best to preach the gospel of normalcy, the flock will rebut to the pastor, it may work for you, but it doesn't work for us. If everyone is special, then is everyone equally an exceptional mom? Mom, how can you talk about being normal if everyone except Jack-Jack must walk on eggshells just to pretend that's the case? Honey, can you stop acting as if our past as superheroes and our powers are a thing we should be ashamed of? What was intended to look after the best interest of the family turned into everyone seeing Helen as the bad guy for spreading a false message in her heart of hearts even she wouldn't believe. This level of backlash isn't easy to handle, especially when one's partner isn't in sync with their wishes. Helen needs Bob to be the disciplinarian. He praises Dash for using his powers. He retreats to the kitchen to finish his paper. He begrudgingly helps her break up the kid's slugfest, and worst of all, she finds out he's been moonlighting as a superhero again, which leads to a shouting match. Helen ultimately argues that he hasn't been all in for the past 15 years of their marriage. Bob's letting Mr. Incredible supersede the needs of his family again. She understands him fondly looking back to the past, but their family is here now and she needs his undivided attention for it. Although Helen is in the right, her words could easily apply to herself. Now let's pull the pin. She sacrificed her career for this partnership to happen.
Island. She does what she can to maintain the ship's sails, whereas her husband, aside from being the linchpin to the family's finances, can't help but tear them down. Bob keeps conversations with her short, is barely willing to be the other parent and undermines her authority. If the roles were flipped and Helen presented the same sentiments she held in her interview long ago, Bob would appreciate her self-expression, but not at the expense of her duties. Helen loves her family too much to allow any of them to disrupt what they have. If she can hang up her costume to observe the present and the future, then Bob must do the same. However, ever since that conversation, everything has been on the up and up. Bob's finances have gotten better, he's more involved with the kids' development, he helps around the house, they rekindled their romance a bit. What more could any wife ask for? Keep the word transparency in mind. When things are going too well, one can either drop the concern or ask why. When the answer is possible in fidelity, then Helen must dust off her go-go gadget magnifying glass. Attention to detail is her thing. When the evidence collected consists of another woman's hair on her husband's suit, eavesdropping on his call with possibly who that hair belongs to, and finally spotting patchwork done on his once pristine super suit. There are too many coincidences. A further investigation must be conducted. Strike one. Helen follows up on the lead from her old suit designer Edna and confirms Bob is continuing his hero work behind her back again and roping the rest of the family along with the creation of their own super suits. This information befuddles Helen, but this pattern of behavior is expected from Bob. Why would he go through great lengths to hide this one? Strike two. Finally, Bob's former employer tells her his employment has been terminated for the past two months when she calls regarding his whereabouts. Bob should be at a business conference. How did he make the money to cover the house, let alone afford two new cars with no job? Strike three. Having these bombs explode in her face turns Helen into an emotional wreck. The extravagant purchases, his weight loss journey, and constant sidestepping the truth. She's asking herself what she did to possibly drive Bob into the arms of another woman. Helen the housewife did nothing wrong. She made the correct choice by following her husband's trail of deception. What she is guilty of is forgetting who the hell she really is. Helen is married to Mr. Incredible, but she has her own identity too. Elastigirl, the superheroine who can stop crime as well as any man with the bantering skills to boot. The woman who can rein in her cantankerous beast of a husband. To think she is sitting in Edna's kitchen with no clue what to do next is ridiculous. She has the power, she has the experience, she has Bob's exact location. Now go out there and put that dog back in his cage. So she calls in a few favors and flies over to No Man of Sand Island. But not without two stowaways. Hey, a mother can only do so much when they have a teenager concerned for both their parents' well-being and relationship and a kid searching for adventure. At the very least, they called a babysitter, so gold star. But something comes back to bite Helen, and that's her restrictions on the family's power usage. She orders Violet to create a force field large enough to cover the plane before the missiles make contact. Violet has no idea what the full range of her powers are because of said restrictions, and the plane goes down because of it. This moment reveals her blind spot as a parent. While she stretches herself thin to maintain the machine, some of the cogs that run it are stifled from her micromanaging. With the current situation at hand, that machine has no choice but to fire on all cylinders or else the PARS will be no more. If it means taking a back seat for those parts to work optimally despite the pressure, then so be it. Although she'll do everything to keep her children safe, she knows two things to be true. She can't watch them and find Bob, and they can't have their understanding of reality back home transferred over to an island where danger lurks from every corner. So a family powwow is conducted where she shows her flexibility by lifting her power restrictions and instilling the confidence they need to see this through. She was a superhero once. Aside from saving the day, they also reassured the public their safety and trust are in the right hands. Why not provide that same faith in her children so they're more comfortable in discovering different facets of their abilities? Since the pups have been taken care of, it's time to look for the dog, and what Helen sees would be her worst nightmare, Bob holding another woman in his arms. Any good faith she would have granted her husband is gone. All she wants to do now is remove the other woman out of the equation and read Bob the Riot Act. However, when push comes to shove, Helen will always remember why she fell in love with Bob. Oh, I, I love, love you. you. Helen's character boils down to being on equal footing with Bob's Mr. Incredible to her Elastigirl. When the going gets tough, why bear the world on your shoulders when there's another equally capable pair willing to help carry that weight? An idea she wants his brain to absorb. What's the point of a marriage if not to go at bat for the other at any point? With Helen rediscovering that drive for heroism and her old identity, fulfilling that objective becomes easier. Helen can communicate better with Bob and be a hero to her kids without being a helicopter parent. For lack of better phrasing, Helen is now a mother allowed to stretch a little less.
For every ship, there is a captain. For every military, there is a general. For every nuclear family, there is a patriarch. He may oversee the entire ship, but that doesn't mean he can fulfill all of its functions. So it makes sense for the labor to be divided among the household since a third of his time is clocked in at work. Since the husband must bring home the bacon, most chores fall on the wife to complete and anything else either parent defers to the kids. Whether you're pro or anti-nuclear family, one thing never changes. The unit is inherently symbiotic. If a crew member goes down, then the productivity of the ship gets hampered. Once the captain goes down, then the quartermaster has to man the ship in their stead. Everyone understands how difficult it is to maintain the household on one's own. Imagine doing all that with a husband who's physically present, but mentally checked out as he looks back on his glory days as a crusader of justice. This is where Bob Parr comes into the picture. Before he fastened his necktie ready to work his 9 to 5 as a claims representative, he once wore his crime fighting blues as the superhero, Mr. Incredible. Using his incredible super strength, he took on many challenges from saving the day twice with one tree to pulling the Spider-Man by stopping a train from flying off the tracks. So incredible with his charisma, he's won another top hero's hand in marriage. If he has the time, he'll do an incredible job keeping a disaster or two at bay. Unfortunately, all good things eventually must come to an end, and Bob, the insurer care claims representative, is the Bob we're familiar with. What could have possibly happened to make the hero among heroes hang up his mask and costume? The two nails to close his coffin? Government regulation and family life. Let's begin with the former. For any person with superhuman capabilities, anything they interact with is liable to sustain damage if not handled carefully. The day-to-day -day hero grind magnifies these concerns. If any personal, public, or private property is to say the least altered, then someone's gonna have to come out of pocket for the expenses. But in the heat of the moment, who really cares about cost? No one's busting out a calculator to estimate the damages on a broken window when someone's flying with style ready to kiss the ground as tackled through it. Then again, if the injuries sustained are not at the fault of their own, but caused by another rational actor, well that's an argument any lawyer can capitalize on. And capitalize they did. Mr. Incredible being sued for saving the suicidal man became the nexus point for all other superhero lawsuits which bled the government coffers dry. Because of these court proceedings, the perception of supers changed for the worse. The heroes that were once seen as the bastions of public safety are now the dregs who disregard the damages they leave behind, and the only way to escape persecution is to relinquish their identity as superheroes. For the rest of their days, talk the talk and walk the walk alongside the average Joe. Now looking at the latter, Mr. Incredible is great at what he does as a superhero. This new commitment, however, needs something more than just heroics. If we reference Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 through 27 and chapter 6 verse 4, Bob is tasked to be a phenomenal husband and father. If Helen must submit herself to Bob, then he must do the same for her and everything else that comes with it. Mind you, in his interview spot, he does express some desire to eventually settle down and make a family. The key word being desire, a want meaning he had a choice in the matter, much like how he chooses to wear his mask. But due to the sudden social and political shift, that choice was made for him. Helen's in the same boat, but she already knows the business. Take a back seat from doing hero work for her family's sake. Bob, unfortunately, does not share the sentiment because being a hero is all he has. The praise, the accolades, displaying his exceptional feats, being recognized for his bravery, and contributing to a society the way he knows best. Take off the mask of Mr. Incredible and what is left. Bob, and being Bob is boring. He gets chewed out by his boss for helping his customers. Helen gives him grief over his lack of involvement with his family and his late night heroics. Even Bob's car screaming he's confined in the world of mediocrity and utterly detests it. Essentially, while Helen keeps her eyes set to the present, Bob's nostalgia goggles are completely glued to his face. Instead of being upset with Dad, she's overjoyed that he used his powers, even asking for additional details as to not only give praise, but to briefly live vicariously through his little quickster. His old friend Frozone questions whether they're flying too close to the sun as they moonlight as superheroes, and because of his actions, it's only a matter of time until the family's cover is blown again. But what can one say to an immovable object who worked alone at his prime and gets a kick out of saving the day. Frankly, nothing outside of focus on the things that matter and stop being selfish. But even that'll fall on deaf ears. He's there for his family, at least on the financial side of things, but draws a blank most of the time on the parenting. Yeah, he won't go to Dash's fourth grade graduation because that's expected, but if the kid participates in sports so he can show off his talents, he'd buy a ticket to the event in a heartbeat. Anyone can be promoted to the next grade, but only a few can be athletes, let alone be on a team starting lineup. 
Athletes, much like heroes, must showcase a substantial level of competence for their chosen sport from the time they try out before even setting foot on the field to compete, which resonates with Bob. What screams excellence more than being placed based on performance and walking home with a trophy? Helen considers Bob's box of awards as junk, but that's his way of tangibly measuring how great of a job he's done once upon a time. A YouTube content creator named Emplemon highlighted two great points at the beginning of his video, Art of the Choke, regarding competition. History will only concern itself with an athlete's win-loss ratio and that most of them will be remembered as losers. Now it's not to say Bob cares solely about the trophies he's awarded. One of the most important attributes of a hero is their selflessness. For Bob, this trait is directly transferred over to his job as a claims rep. He'll be a hero to the clients he sees even up to giving them a roadmap to avoid any of the company's bureaucratic ups instructions despite angering his boss Mr. Huff. At the end of the day, what will a hero prioritize more? Making company shareholders happy or doing right by the customer? And it takes one final tongue lashing from Mr. Huff for Bob to realize it's all he can stands, he can't stands no more. But it also means he's out of a job, stands a way to effectively provide for his family, until he's surprised with an opportunity to subdue an experimental robot on a remote island to the tune of three times his annual salary. Sounds way too good to be true, but what are Bob's available options, tell the missus he lost his job and blew his cover, or take this chance and solidify the family's finances while reliving his golden years. After all, who would be any of the wiser? So with a hop, a skip, and a lie, he agrees to do it. To say Bob's disposition after completing his mission did a 180 would be an understatement. Since he feels fulfilled living as a hero again, his quality of life increased all around. He wants for nothing financially, he's more involved with raising the kids, his relationship with his wife couldn't be any better, and to add a cherry on top, found time to improve his look. Everything's coming up Millhouse for Bob right now, but there's an elephant with Mole Man's luck in the room. He can only keep the secret from his family for so long before his house cards turns into a game of 52 pickup. Helen becomes suspicious with his daily affairs and when called to complete another mission, he's greeted with a bigger and better Omni droid along with its creator, Syndrome. I did a video on the character if you want further context. Just know he's not the biggest fan of supers and would love nothing more than to give Mr. Incredible the gift of a shallow grave. In its totality, Helen was correct for having this house rule. Standing out by displaying one's powers to any degree will attract a lot of unwanted attention. Before he's even able to bite the bullet and admit this is the case, Bob mourns the death of his family coming to save him. For all Bob knows, he failed in both his duties from the lies he's told just to reclaim the feelings of excellence from the past. Two months of involvement with the family doesn't compensate for the years of lost time. Now that he's witnessed their demise, that chance to catch up is gone. Although Bob cries over this revelation, Syndrome reminds him of the fact that he worked alone. And he's right. He's alone when he clocks in the work. He's alone when he absorbs the daily exploits of other supers. He's generally alone in his ideology of going above and beyond in everything amongst most of his contemporaries. And like the other supers who are trying to fill the void, especially Gazer Beam, he can die on this island alone. However, lucky for him, he married Elastigirl, who isn't only just as bullheaded as he is when it comes to her principles, she's just as capable of dancing the superhero tango. And the kids learned a few steps in the process. It's great that he's reacquired with his family, able to fight alongside them and even hold himself accountable by apologizing for his partial commitment. Still, for some reason, he decides to face the final Omnidroid on his own. Helen thinks he's set back in his ways to get a workout in, but it's the exact opposite. He's already failed at his duties as a father and husband with his absent mind. He chose to continue hero work much to the dismay of his family, and he thought they died in the plane's explosion. And as the common denominator, he should be the one to subdue the rogue automaton as an actor of penance. He already lost them once, he doesn't want to lose them again, but he doesn't have to. Helen, during the search and rescue mission, finally pulled the covers off her old identity, and their kids are more adept at using their powers. In short, Bob has more hands. He doesn't have to be over encumbered with the weight of the world anymore. They're a family full of superheroes. What could possibly go wrong if they all work together? And just by allowing them to give an extra hand, the Omnidroid built to destroy Mr. Incredible didn't stand a chance against the Incredible. In the most roundabout way, he learned two things. There is no I in team, and there's nothing more amazing than creating an incredible family.